So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, function estimation on, on data streams. And um, this is this work from two papers, uh, joint with uh, Yarek at Harvard, Vova and Lynn at Johns Hopkins, Roby at Weizmann, and David at IBM. Okay. So like I said, function approximation on streams. So let me tell you what is a stream and what is a sort of function approximation problem. A uh, stream is just a, a long list of additive updates to some high dimensional vector. Okay, so in this case, the dimension is four, and uh, each of these updates just tells us, uh, identifies a coordinate of the vector. And uh, it's gonna result in an increment to, the, to that particular coordinate. Our goal is to some, compute some uh, function of the vector at the end of the stream, okay? So this, as uh, we read the stream, the vector changes. We increment the third coordinate when we read a three, the second coordinate when we read a two, et cetera. And um, our goal is to approximate the, the sum of the squares of this vector, so this particular problem, um, uh, at the end of the stream. Okay, so of course we can do that if we just store the entire vector, but uh, that takes way too much space. So the question is, uh, how can we estimate this without storing the entire vector? How can we get a, like a small summary of f from which we can extract uh, the sum of the squares? Okay, so this is a, it's a classic problem with a really elegant solution. Um, we can, we can do it basically with one inner product, or a small number of inner products. So what we do is we sample a random vector, and we compute the inner product of this random vector with the high dimensional vector. Because the high dimensional vector is basically a sum of unit vectors, and the inner product is linear, we can compute this with just one counter. Um, uh, in expectation, we get exactly what we're trying to approximate. So by repeating and taking medians and averaging, uh, we can get like a high probability, high accuracy estimate. Okay, and uh, sort of a caveat is you need to store the space for this. You need to store this big vector z. This is n uh, plus or minus ones. That would require n space if they were uh, independent, but if we can use limited limit independence and still get the same guarantee. Okay, so that gives us like a log n bits algorithm for approximating um, the sum of the squares of the coordinates in the vector. So what we're going to rest of this talk is going to be about uh, approximating different functions besides the sum of the squares. I showed you this one; it's pretty easy. Okay. For these problems, there's there's broadly uh, two types of algorithms. Okay. Uh, the first type I call randomize and repeat, and that's where the last algorithm fits in. So we kind of inject some randomness in the stream. The stream is a deterministic thing; it's sort of adversarial ordered, if you want. We inject some randomness, and we cook up an unbiased estimator for the quantity we're interested in. And then we repeat this and take averages and medians with the goal of, of driving down the error. Okay, so this has been successful, um, for example, on the previous slide with, with uh, the sum of the squares. I can replace the square with uh, some power p less than or equal to two, and I can uh, have, a, have a similar algorithm. Um, it doesn't seem to work everywhere, this strategy. So um, 2005, um, for the large frequency moments, uh, Indic and Woodruff developed this hierarchical subsampling type algorithm. So, so the idea here is instead of cooking up an unbiased estimator for the, the, the value we're interested in, we're going to try to estimate the entire vector, come up with an approximation for the entire vector, and then use that approximation to approximate the, the value of the sum at the end. Okay, so that, that seems, to be, seems to be much more versatile. Um, uh, it has worked for a lot, a lot of problems, LP norms, cascaded norms, this kind of generic sum problem, which I'll talk about more. Um, and there's a lot more work. I, I just put a, a, a few references here. And in general, for these in the streaming model, we have strong lower bounds. So I'm interested in the space complexity, how much storage is needed to approximate some function like the P norm of this, this vector. And uh, we have matching upper and lower bounds, at least within some like, polylogarithmic factors for almost all these problems. Okay. Um, so I'll talk about upper and lower bounds in the rest of the talk. Okay, so the talk is, uh, is kind of in two parts. The first part is about functions uh, this form, where I'm going to compute a sum over the coordinates. Okay, so this is, uh, is a special case, contains the uh, frequency moments, um, but uh, also entropy and other, other examples. So here's some kind of the goal. So our goal is um, you're going to give in this function g, and what 
we'd like to do is I'd like to classify. Um, can I approximate this function in very small space, like polylogarithmic space, or does it require a large space, a polynomial space in N and M? Um, motivation for this is it's a kind of a striking dichotomy in the frequency moments, or the LP norms. So in particular, if I choose, let's see, I think that's the, okay. If I choose uh, g of x to be x to the power of p, I'm looking for the, sort of the, the pth moment of the vector. For p less than or equal to 2, this can be done in log n bits. For p strictly greater than 2, it requires polynomial space. Okay, it's kind of a, a dichotomy there. Um, so the question is, what's special about p less than or equal to 2 greater than 2? Um, if I'm given another function, how can I know when the function, when I can approximate this sum in, in small space or not? Okay. Uh, and uh, just to, for um, various reasons, this sort of interesting case is uh, m and n are like polynomially related. So, so basically log m and log n are the same. Um, and uh, and g, is, g is strictly positive on the positive half line. So I'm going to tell you uh, in the next couple of slides uh, classification for, for these functions. So not actually for all functions. I'm going to tell you, except for this small, strange class of functions, I'm going to give you a classification that says, here are three properties. A function has a polylogarithmic space approximation algorithm if and only if it satisfies all three of these properties. OK, so to get some intuition about why that works and actually how we get our algorithm is a uh, we're going to use a hierarchical subsampling um, reduction, which basically allows us to reduce from finding uh, an approximation to the sum, right? This is sum is what we're interested in approximating, to just finding so-called heavy hitters. Okay, so I say an item is a heavy hitter for a sum, so an alpha heavy hitter, if, it, if its contribution to the sum is at least an alpha fraction of the total. Okay, so think about alpha as a small number like uh, 1% or, or Maybe a little bit smaller. So, so the the idea from Indigen Woodruff and also from this paper of Vova is uh, if we can find heavy hitters, then we can output an approximation. So I'm going to use this as a black box. My goal is now just to find these these items which are heavy hitters. So I just want to find items which contribute a big portion of the sum. Okay, and I'll talk more about this reduction later on. Actually. Okay, so what do we know about finding heavy hitters? There's a big literature on heavy hitters. Um, Finding heavy hitters with respect to the sum, so the, and also the sum of squares. So the famous algorithm of count sketch, Charkar, Chen, and Farrah Colton, that uh, identifies heavy hitters um, when when g is is the quadratic. Um, it does so using like one over alpha space. You can't really expect to do any better than one over alpha space because there may be one over alpha many of them. Um, and, and furthermore, it outputs an estimate of the uh, frequency of each heavy hitter. Okay. So this is what we know how to find, uh, the F2 heavy hitters. And uh, what we want to find are, are sort of G heavy hitters. Uh, and I guess one important point is that this, this estimate is uh, it's like a relative error estimate when the item is a heavy hitter. And it's even a little bit better than that. It's a so-called tail estimate. So the accuracy doesn't depend on uh, the other heavy hitters in the stream. Okay? So I get, a, I get an estimate for fi, which is like proportional to the, the, this sum without the, with the other heavy hitters removed. OK, um, okay that'll come in handy. All right, so now I'm going to tell you this is a characterization. And as we go along, I'll, I'll kind of explain like why why do these three things help us find heavy hitters? Um, okay, so here's my kind of generic function g. It starts at zero. It kind of increases and it decreases a little bit. It's going to increase some more. So I'm going to tell you these three properties. They're sufficient for a polylogarithmic space approximation algorithm, and um, almost necessary. I'll come to the come to the almost in the end. Okay, so the first. Uh, First of the properties we'll call slow jumping. So uh, roughly a function is, is slow jumping if it kind of never grows faster than the quadratic. So it all scales. It's growing like the quadratic or slower than the quadratic. 
Um, what this is going to mean is that if y here is the biggest frequency in the stream, and it's a G heavy hitter, then it's also going to be uh, an F2 heavy hitter. Okay, if it's the biggest frequency in the stream and it's a heavy hitter. Of course, there's no need that uh, a heavy hitter be the largest frequency in the stream because the function can decrease. So I could have many larger frequencies, maybe which which in total don't have very much contribution. Okay. Uh, second property we're going to call is uh, second property we're going to call slow dropping. So slow dropping basically says that the function is allowed to decrease, but it's not allowed to decrease very much. This uh, squiggly I should have said on the last slide. The squiggly here like allow, allow any polylogarithmic factor in y and x, um, and, and still consider that inequality is satisfied. Okay, so it sort of says that uh, if I replace this with an equals, it would be uh, g of y is bigger than g of x. But I don't really require g of y is bigger than g of x. I just require uh, g of x is not too much bigger than g of y. Okay, so what this says is that if uh, if g of x is a heavy hitter, then there can't be too many items in the stream which are larger than g of x. That's because if g of x is a heavy hitter, then all the items which are larger than uh, have frequency larger than x kind of also have a big contribution. So if g of x is a heavy hitter, it's sort of like saying that y is also a heavy hitter or it's close to a heavy hitter. And there can't be too many items which are close to a heavy hitter because like, if I have alpha, if I'm looking for alpha heavy hitters, there can be at most one over alpha of them. Okay, so, so this kind of says like if I'm looking for 1% heavy hitters, and there can be at most like log n times 100 uh, items, items larger than, than the heavy hitter. Okay. So now, in, com in uh, combination with the, with the previous property, with the slow jumping, uh, these two sort of guarantee that we can identify uh, the G heavy hitters with a count sketch. Um, the, the last one says that, that if this item is the largest one in the stream, then it's going to be a, a F2 heavy hitter, so we could find it with a count sketch. And this one says if it's not the largest item in the stream, well, what we can do is we can just hash a bunch of different ways. And then uh, each of these sort of heavy hitters and, and pseudo heavy hitters will end up uh, different, different uh, buckets of the hash. If we run a count sketch on each of these um, buckets, the actual heavy hitters will be the largest frequencies in the stream. Okay, so, so together, this like slow dropping and slow jumping properties, what they say is that uh, every item which is a G heavy hitter is also a F2 heavy hitter. So we can, we can identify it. Okay, but identifying it is only, only part of the game. We also have to kind of approximate their frequencies. Okay, so I gave you a condition on the increase of the function. I'm going to give you a condition I gave you a condition on the, the decay of the function. Um, the third condition is about local variability. All right, so it, it comes in kind of two parts, and the first part is very natural, and the second part is not natural, uh, at least the first time you see it. We'll call this predictability. And so I've got a point x and a point y, and I'm going to assume that y minus x are very close to each other. Okay, so if y minus x are close, I got, what our algorithm is going to do is it's going to find a, an estimate if x is a heavy hitter, it's going to try to find an estimate for the frequency x, but it may make an error. The, the estimate might be off a little bit. Uh, and so, so if the estimate, I have accidentally substituted in a y for an x, I would like it not to change the, the value of the sum very much. I'd like that not, not, to, not to have a big impact on my overall estimate for the sum. Um, so what, what happens is if, if y minus x is, is much smaller than x, one of, one of two things is okay. Either G of y basically has the same value as G of x. So this is like naturally a good condition, right? If, uh, if, I, if I accidentally substitute in a y, I don't make a change to the value of the function. Okay, but, but we're not going to require that that's the case. Actually, it's not, um, it's not necessary that that's the case. So the second condition uh, sort of looks like this. G of x and G of y can, can be pretty different. They could be, I say, different by, say, like a large constant factor or even, even maybe more different. Um, but still very close. So now in this case, the question is how, if I could accidentally substitute in a y for my x, I would get a, I would get a big error. So how are we going to prevent that? Okay, so here we kind of like crucially use the, this tail estimate property of the count sketch. So let's do a, I'll kind of describe this to you and we'll do a thought experiment. Um, suppose that, 
that uh, x is the heavy hitter in the stream. And um, y is some value is as larger than x, so that g of y is much bigger than g of x. So the condition says that I want g of y minus x to be, to be basically as big as g of x, or maybe larger. OK? So suppose for a second that y minus x was a frequency in the stream. OK? Then it would be a heavy hitter, because x is a heavy hitter, and g of y minus x is bigger than, than g of x. So from the previous two properties, we know that uh, y minus x is an F2 heavy hitter. And we know that uh, the number of frequencies kind of in this region is very small. OK? This is from the slow dropping property. Um, in particular, the count sketch is going to give us a relative error estimate with relative error compared to the smallest heavy hitter, or the smallest of the F2 heavy hitters that we need to find. So our count sketch is actually going to give us an error that's like proportional to y minus x. So if, the error, if I can get the error down to half y minus x, then I can completely rule out. I'll the algorithm will never accidentally find uh, y instead of, instead of where it should have found x. Okay, so this estimate kind of controls, this, this, this property controls the local variability. It says that the, the function is allowed to have a lot of local variability um, if it doesn't change too much on a global scale. Um, but if it is changing on a global scale, that would be this case doesn't apply, then no local va variability is allowed. All right, so, so kind of to cement it, let me go through two examples. One of them is 2 plus sine x. So this function just, just goes between 1 and 3. Um, so it definitely doesn't satisfy the first condition. I'll so take epsilon to be 1 half. Um, I can take x and y to be very close to each other, and it won't, won't satisfy them. Um, but the second condition is always satisfied, because, because uh, g of any point is at least 1 third of g of any other point. So I can put a one third in there and satisfy that inequality. Okay, so that's a, that's a good example. This this function, which is kind of periodic and positive, is uh, okay. Um, sort of a negative example is if I take this two plus sine x and I multiply it by a quadratic. So now the function is changing um, rapidly and it's it's increasing as it does it. Okay, so it's still only changing locally by a factor of three, but uh, but. Because it's increasing, it doesn't satisfy this, this second condition. Okay, and so here actually you'll find like a, if you if you want to go through the math uh, with the index reduction, you can get like a linear lower bound on the storage required to approximate this, this function. Okay. So so that's about streaming sums, three properties. I told you it characterizes almost all functions. Um, so I'll give you a reference later for precise details. But about any function you can come up with, if it's, um, it's going to be polylogarithmic space approximable, uh, if and only if it satisfies all three of these conditions. Okay, and we get lower bounds from uh, some standard reductions to communication complexity problems like multi-party disjointness and index. Okay. Um, so let me, let me tell you about this, this almost necessary part. So there's a small kind of class of functions that, that we don't know anything about. And they're strange. They look like this one. OK. This is an example of one of these functions. Question. So the function 1 over x, that's, that's yeah. it's the epidemic at all, but is that only for one plus epsilon distributions? Or could you, for instance, approximate within a polynomial factor or polynomial factor? Um, for that's a good question. For 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 one for one over x, um, no. So this like I'm only talking about approximations like the constant factor and, and better. Um, but uh, for one over x, you could still get a lower bound, which would be like linear divided by your approximation ratio or something like that. So if you want to square root an approximation, you would maybe even you could still get a linear lower bound. I think you would still get linear, actually, in that case. So, Piotr, I, and Andrew looked at this uh, information distances. Yeah. 1 by x is close to the sum of the chi squared. That's the correct order of how it would be because it's x minus 1 divided by x squared, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, all of them have polynomial All information distances, other than the least square or the 1, uh, 
Thanks. Okay. So, so let me tell you about this, this weird function, and then I'll, I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk. Um, so I'm going to define uh, the function to be, so at each point, x, I look for the largest power of 2 that divides x. And I take the function to be 1 over that power of 2. Okay, so at, at 1 half, it's equal, sorry, at, at x equals 2, it's equal to 1 half. At x equals 4, it's equal to 1 quarter. At x equals 2 to the j, it's 1 over 2 to the j. At x equals 2 to the j times 3, it's 1 over 2 to the j. Okay, so at all the odd numbers, it's back to 1. And then even numbers, half of the even numbers, it's a half. And a quarter of the even numbers, it's at a quarter, et cetera. So this is very like repetitive algebraic structure. It's not periodic, but it looks kind of periodic. We call this nearly periodic. Um, this function is, uh, doesn't satisfy any of the three properties. It's not slow jumping, slow dropping, or predictable. Um, but actually, we can approximate this guy in polylogarithmic space um, with the same reduction as before. We find heavy hitters. But now we use some kind of divisibility property. So this function has a very special divisibility relationship. Um, so I can find heavy hitters. For example, if I want to identify whether there's a, an odd frequency in the stream that's easy to do, I can just kind of like split the stream randomly into two parts and compute the total sum of the frequencies. And if the sum is odd, then I know there must be an odd frequency. Um, by, by repeating this a couple of times, I can get high probability I can identify the frequencies. So this one we can do in polylogarithm space. It doesn't satisfy any of our three properties. There are a bunch of other functions that sort of look like this, and um, we, don't know how to, we don't know how to address them, basically. Uh, look like this, imagine with a, like, a little bit of error. So this, this kind of like precise algebraic characterization of the function falls apart. OK. So that's uh, streaming sums. Now I'm going to talk about uh, symmetric norms. Um, So the model is the same. Uh, we have the stream. We find the vector at the end. And I'm interested in approximating some norm. So the two norms is the same as, as I showed you on the second slide of the talk. Um, so the question is, how can we estimate this norm in small space without storing the vector? OK. So what I'm going to show you in the rest of the talk is, uh, is matching uh, upper and lower bounds for this space complexity of approximating any symmetric norm. Okay, so symmetric norm means the norm is uh, invariant under coordinate permutations, and it's also invariant under sign changes. So the LP norms are examples. There's two other examples here I'm gonna, I'll talk about later. Um, cascaded norms are not an example. Um, induced matrix norms or the Shatten norms, except for Shatten 2, um, are not examples. Okay, so symmetric norms have an important property that we're gonna make heavy use of and this is a monotonicity. OK, so this is not true for all norms. But for symmetric norms, um, if, if x is less than y, coordinate y is an absolute value, then, then the norm values respect the same order. OK, so if I increase x, I get a bigger norm. That's the idea. Uh, it's not true for all norms. All right. um, that's good. OK, so let me introduce uh, the parameter. Um, this is kind of, in the end, going to tell us what's the space complexity of every norm, every symmetric norm. So we'll call it uh, the modulus of concentration, and it's this ratio of b over m. So here's how we've, we find these, these, this b and this m. To find b, I look at the, uh, the unit sphere, so that's the L2 unit sphere, and I look at the norm of every point, and I choose the maximum value attained by that norm on the unit sphere. Okay, that's b. So b is the largest value of the, of the norm on the unit sphere. Um, and now m is the median over the unit sphere. So imagine if I randomly choose a point from the sphere and uh, plug it into the norm that gives me a random variable, the median of the distribution of that random variable is m. Okay? So modulus of concentration is just the ratio of b over m. Of course, it's, uh, it's at least 1 because uh, the maximum is bigger than the median. Okay, so here's a, a couple of unit balls. That's L1, L3, and, and some other... Uh, unit ball, which I could draw in ticks. And uh, here's some kind of examples of what's, what's B, what's M, and how, um, where are the vectors that achieve these values. Okay, so for the L1 ball, B is square root N. This is achieved in the L1's direction. And, uh, and, and the median value is also about square root N. Okay. 
Um, kind of a nice rule of thumb is if I, if I want to know what's the median, um, I can look at a vector which is uh, all 1 over square root n, so in the all 1's direction. And for a symmetric norm, I'm going to get close. Um, we'll actually prove that later on. Um, for the L3 ball, for the L3 norm, b is 1. That's a chain by any standard unit vector, standard basis vector. And, but the median is like n to the minus 1 6. So this ratio is, is n to the 1 6. OK, and for this norm, I don't know what it is. So just the connection, this, this, this b over m is, uh, that's not the first place it ever came up, is m, this co uh, modulus of concentration. So here's the theorem, um, it's uh, Duretz Voretsky's theorem about embeddings. So roughly, Voretsky's theorem is, is telling us um, if I want to embed L2 into a, a norm linear space, it's telling me how, how large a dimension can I, can I perform this embedding for. Okay, so I have a norm linear space on n dimensions. Um, what's the maximum d for which I can embed L2d into this space with 1 plus epsilon distortion? It's some constant depending on epsilon times n over mc squared, Okay, at least that large. Uh, um, so Milman gave a proof of this, which uses a probabilistic method in a nice way. Um, so this is a, the, at least I can always embed into, into uh, at least this, this large in L2 into space. Um, OK, so I don't know how to use this theorem for streaming, but uh, it's a cool connection. This, we were sort of investigating this, and that's how we came up upon the parameter mc. OK, so I'll, I'm going to prove a lower bound for you. Uh, and then later on, we'll talk about algorithms. OK, so the lower bound is going to come from um, communication complexity of multi-party disjointness. OK, so, so that's a standard problem for lower bounds in um, norms, so the LP norms for P bigger than 2. This is where the lower bound comes from. Um, so I'll, let me quickly tell you what's the problem, and then uh, I'll, I'll show you how the reduction works. It's not, the reduction is not standard. Um, so we have t players and, uh, and a set of items from 1 to n. Each player is given a subset of the items with a promise that one of two things happens. Either the subsets are all disjoint, or there's a single item which everybody has, and otherwise the subsets are disjoint. Okay, and so the players communicate to determine um, which of these two cases occurs. Okay, so the first player, he writes some bits. The second player, he writes some bits. The, the teeth player, he gets all the bits, and he has to declare, is this a disjoint instance or an intersecting instance? So this when it's a disjoint instance. Okay, and so uh, the number of bits is, uh, is n over t, and um, I just give one reference, but there's, there's many more. This is a, just a piece in a very big puzzle, uh, eventually Proving, proving this lower bound. Um, OK, so that's the multi-party disjointness problem. So what I want to prove is that uh, if I can get a two approximation for the norm, I'm going to use at least mc squared bits of memory. OK, and uh, so for some kind of pictorial notation, I'm going to choose a vector v which uh, attains the maximum. So it's a unit vector, and it, and it attains the maximum value of the norm over the unit ball. So, um, because the norm is symmetric, I can reorder the coordinates however I want, and, uh, and I can assume they're all positive. So I'm just going to write them down positive here. And I've kind of drawn the vector like as if you, if you typed into MATLAB plot v, you would get this sort of like graph of the vector, right? So this is oh, the, the values of the coordinates on the y-axis and the number of the coordinate on the x-axis. OK, so this, you're going to see a bunch of these pictures on the next slide. OK, so here's the, here's the reduction. So we want to approximate, uh, or I want to show that, that if we can approximate this norm, then, then these players, the t players, are going to be able to distinguish uh, which of the two cases. OK, so I'll take this vector v. And for each item in my universe, 1 to n, I'm going to cyclically shift v. OK, that's what these, these things are. These are like shifts of the same vector. OK, so I just shift it cyclically uh, n different times. Okay, so you could think about if I wrote this in a big matrix, then I would have vectors, shifts of vectors v on the rows, and I also have shifts of vectors v on the columns because uh, I'm just shifting one. So each each item appears once in every column. I mean, each uh, coordinate of the vector appears once in every column. Okay, so that's the first part. So for each item, I have a, I have now a vector. Now I'm going to randomize these vectors. Okay, so 
for each of those vectors, I'm going to replace uh, the vector with uh, uh, a random vector with normal coordinates. The coordinates are going to be mean 0 and um, variance equal to the square of the value in v. Okay, so standard deviation, so v is like the vector of standard deviations for this random vector. Okay? So I have this cyclically shifted random vectors. They're all going to be independent, and this is going to be shared among the players. So this shared randomness. All right. So now what happens um, in the two cases? In the first case, uh, or what, the, what the reduction is, 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 is a player, she has uh, items one and three. So she picks the vector, which is shift, the random vector shifted by one, and the random vector shifted by three. She adds them to the stream, and she runs the norm approximation algorithm. She sends the memory to player two. Player two has items two, six, and eight. He adds those three vectors to the stream, and he runs the norm approximation, and he sends the memory to player three, et cetera. So the memory is transferred t times. Finally, player t gets the memory. He adds his stuff to the stream. And then at the end, he, he runs the norm approximation. OK, so what happens? There's two different cases. In the top case, the disjoint case, there's no coherence among these random vectors. So what we end up with is something that looks like uh, a uniform random vector with zero one coordinates, normal zero one coordinates. Okay, actually, the, the variance might be slightly smaller, but the monotonicity is going to allow us to to um, to handle that. So we're going to get something that's like a um, just a scaled up random vector from the unit sphere. Okay, this is random independent Gaussian coordinates. So the norm should be like square root n times m. Um, in the intersecting case, then I have this one one shift, which is repeated. T times. Okay, so I get like uh, I get the this randomized uh, vector v plus some some noise, right? And so the triangle inequality tells me that I get something that's like t times b minus uh, square root n m. So to to do this, you have to prove that the, this randomized vector also has norm approximately b, but that's not too hard. Um, so what it means in the end is that if I choose if I choose t to be like square root n over mc, I can distinguish these two, uh, these two cases, and, uh, and I get an mc squared bits lower bound. OK. So now let's talk about, so I, I showed you uh, definition of mc. We talked about Varetsky's theorem. I showed you an mc squared bits lower bound. Um, so let's talk about some upper bounds. So LP norms, P less than 2. B and M are the same order. So MC squared is 1, more or less. Space is log N. B equals 2. B and M exactly 1. MC is exactly 1. Space is log N bits. B greater than 2. Um, B and M now different orders. Uh, MC is uh, N to the 1 half minus 1 over P. Space complexity is MC squared times log N bits. Okay, so we have upper and lower bounds that seem to match. Is that, is that the right answer? Uh, no. Okay. Um, and there's a kind of a natural thing that we're missing. Here's a, here's a counter example. So I take a norm, the maximum of two norms is a norm. So I'll take the maximum of the infinity norm and a scaling of the one norm, scaled by one over n, one over root n. Okay. So, so the sort of the b here for this norm is one, right? It's, it's one for that one, and it's one for the scaled uh, one norm. So the b is one. And the average value, it turns out, is also about about one is constant, some kind of constant. So the mc is one, mc squared is one, uh, but I require linear sp or a uh, quadratic. Uh, sorry, um, square root n space to approximate this guy. So let's kind of let's kind of diagnose what happened because we had a nice there was a nice pattern going right but um, it doesn't seem to hold here. So the, the problem is this 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 infinity norm of course. So so what's going on is we have this sort of hidden lower dimensional space where the norm is really hard to approximate. Okay, so if I have any algorithm which can approximate this norm on n dimensions, then I can approximate the infinity norm on square root n dimensions. Why is that? That's because if I if I take a vector which has support smaller than or equal to square root n, the maximum is always achieved by the left side, by the infinity part. Okay, Because I have the average, uh, something like the average of the coordinates versus the 
the maximum. Okay, so so if I have a, if I can approximate this norm, then I can on, on n dimensions I can approximate the infinity norm on square root n dimensions. That's that requires square root n bits. Um, so so where does that come about in our MC? Like why does why does that happen? That's because we sort of sort of missed something, right? What we missed was this norm. So I'll call it the primed norm. It's a norm on r square root n. So what I do is I take a vector in r square root n, and I pad it with zeros until I have n, and that gives me a uh, sorry, so that I can evaluate its norm on n dimensions, and that gives me a norm, induces a norm on square root n dimensions. So if my streaming algorithm is going to approximate this norm, it's definitely got to approximate that norm too. Okay. Uh, the MC for this norm, I call MC prime here, is uh, like n to the one quarter, so MC prime squared is square root n with a log factor. Okay. So that suggests kind of an obvious fix, uh, at least of attempts to fix. And it works. So what I'll do is I'll take the maximum modulus of concentration over all of these padded norms. So I have n norms, uh, each with a different support size. And uh, I can define the MC for each of them, and I take the maximum of those. Okay, So I'll call that the MMC, the maximum modulus of concentration. And uh, so the main result for the second half of the talk is that um, this MMC squared up to some polylog factor uh, characterizes the space complexity for uh, approximating this norm. Um, so we're lower bound, lower bound follows directly from the lower bound I just showed you, right? So I, I said that if I, if I, I mean, I proved a lower bound for all of these norms at the same time as I proved a lower bound for uh, the the original norm. Okay, so, so this follows directly from what we already did. Okay, uh, how am I doing on time? Seven minutes, okay. All right, so I will, um, I'll give you two examples and then I'll kind of skip to like where does measure concentration come in? We use measure concentration in the proof. Sorry, it minutes. 12 minutes, okay. Um, okay. So there's two examples. Uh, these are other symmetric norms which are, are not uh, norms that people have, have uh, characterized for a streaming complexity yet. So the first one is a simple one, it's called top K. So it kind of interpolates between L1 and L infinity. I take the largest k coordinates in absolute value and I sum them up. Okay, so M MC for this norm is square root n over k. That means the space is like n over k. So if I choose k as linear in n, then I get a polylogarithmic space approximation. Depending on how I choose k, I get different approximations. Okay. So the second one, um, okay, so I, I chose this one because it kind of um, highlights the fact that, that we're not using any functional form of the norm. There's nothing special about the way the norm is computed. Um, it's called the K-support norm. It's been proposed as a regularizer for some sparse recovery problems. And there's not a formula for it. There's an algorithm that computes it. It's easiest to describe in terms of its unit ball. So I'm going to tell you the unit ball. Um, look at the L infinity, sorry, the L2 unit ball. And um, restrict just to the points which have k non-zero coordinates, so support size k, that's the k support. Uh, and now I take the convex hull of all those points. Okay, so if I take the one support norm, then I get just the L1 unit ball. L1, L, L, uh, one support norm is L1. Um, the n support norm is L2, and k support norm for k between 1 and n is somewhere in between those. It sort of looks like a shaved part of the L2 unit ball away. Okay, so, so this norm is, uh, we can approximate in in um, polylogarithmic space. Actually, this is part of a big class of norms that have a special dual structure, all of which we can approximate in polygon space. Um, by the way, this, this norm is the dual norm to our bad example from earlier. Okay. All right, so let me tell you about the algorithm. It's hierarchical subsampling, and the analysis is uh, uh, different from what you might have seen before. So the idea is uh, we're going we're gonna to round the vector, and then uh, this would this kind of naturally gives us a small space representation because I have like log n different levels. I need to just determine the size of each one, and that's enough information to compute the norm because the norm is symmetric. I just need to know how many coordinates at each of these levels. Um, but we can't identify all of the levels, so we're going to forget some of them, and then uh, we're going to try to estimate the rest of them. And uh, what we're going to prove is that 
even given some estimates and forgetting these levels and doing the rounding, altogether we still have a good approximate, good approximation. So in the end, we get a we get an approximate vector, and we plug the approximate vector into some algorithm that computes the norm. Okay, so my streaming algorithm just outputs a small space representation of an approximate vector, and then you want to compute the norm, you have to do it uh, however you know how. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me, okay, I'll do this one first. So I'm going to look at one of these levels, this little vi, and I'm going to define, I'm going to treat vi like a vector. So it's just the coordinates in vi and then zeros everywhere else. So this is a little square. Okay. So I'll call a level beta contributing if, if its norm is like a beta fraction of the total norm. So this is like a heavy hitter. Uh, that's the way you should think about it. And easy lemma is just a triangle inequality. It just says, uh, if I, if I forget all of the non-beta contributing levels, then I, I pay most of this factor, 1 minus beta times log n. That's because log n over log alpha is the number of levels. OK. Um, that's easy. So we're, we're, all we have to do is find these beta contributing levels, I, or identify the sizes. So the idea of hierarchical subsampling is I just uh, randomly sample until I have one item left in each level, and then I try to determine the point at where I have only one item left. Okay, so we'll use a count sketch to, to, to do that. And um, the next slide will kind of tell you where, why a count sketch works. So we have this key lemma. Key lemma controls the norm of this level based on the number of coordinates it has, based on its support size. Okay, so it kind of says that if I look at this, this ratio, set n pr double prime equal to n to n, this says that the norm of the level decreases at a certain rate as the size of the level decreases. Okay, so that means we can't have a small level that really makes a big contribution. So I don't have to try to find small levels. Okay, or if I do, it's going to mean the MMC is very large. Um, so what are the consequences? Um, so if I look at just the, the vector to the left, so I'm looking at level i, it's a beta contributing. If I look at the items to the left, then, then this basically says that this is the, this is the second moment of the, of the vector of just these items. So this says, like, uh, this level is beta over MMC contributing for the two norm on the vector restricted to the left-hand side. And this is saying that there's only, like, uh, MMC squared over beta squared items on the right-hand side. Okay, so, so by hashing and uh, using a count sketch, I can get an approximate count for the number of items in level I. Okay, then you have to do some work to prove that having an approximate count for the level actually gives you an approximation to the norm. Um, but, uh, but that's the idea of the algorithm. So let me tell you kind of quickly uh, how we use measure concentration. And, uh, and then I'll finish. Um, so this is Levy's lemma. Levy's lemma is isoparametric inequality. Um, what it, the way we use it it, it, it says the following. If I have a continuous function, defined on the unit sphere. That's the norm is a continuous function on the unit sphere. And I look at the median. That's this, this thick red line, the, dar the darker red line. Then um, and I take an epsilon width neighborhood around the median. Okay, So epsilon width means like the distance in Euclidean length between any vector, oops, sorry, any vector uh, in this, this shaded red area and s the closest point on the, the dark red line is at most epsilon, OK? What uh, Levy's lemma tells us is, that, is that, that the probability of this shaded region is really large. Okay, it's close to 1. So almost the entire sphere is very close to the median. That's the measure concentration. And um, so the way we use it, we want to prove that this vector in the all 1's direction has a norm approximately equal to the median. I, I told you earlier on that if you wanted like a rule of thumb was, was substitute in the all ones vector to compute the median. So th what we're going to do is, is, is prove that that's the case. And so the way we do it is a probabilistic method. Um, because this takes up almost all of the sphere, I can simultaneously find a point which is very close to the median in the infinity norm, very close to the median in the L1 norm, and very close to the median in the norm where, that we're interested in. OK, so, so I just make sure each of those probabilities is at larger than, than two-thirds, and I, and I find some, some such point. But now, since the point is close to 
the um, L infinity median, all of its coordinates are, are pretty small because L infinity median is like root log n over n. Since it's, of course, close to the L1 norm, the total sum of the coordinates is pretty big. I put those two things together, it sort of looks like the all1s vector, and then we can use symmetry and monotonicity to just kind of massage it into the all1s vector. But, but this, this point, we also said it was close to the median in, in the norm that we're interested in. So, so we get this, this guy. So it's a probabilistic method to prove this inequality. That's the, use, that's the measure concentration. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, this is algorithm summary. Um, it's it's a hierarchical subsampling. OK. Uh, and that's, that's all I have. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>